seminar we all took, I, I want to tell us here too, uh, which means that I have to ask the question before any sensible person starts a seminar, how many people actually got to read it? I'm just, okay, so two thirds? Okay. Now it's predicated up to a point on, the, we talking about a book we all have, <coughs> so I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll try, but without that, you know, it's going to be a little mysterious at times. I'll just begin by saying a few things about Michael Frame. Uh, you may anyone know him previously? He's quite famous in England, a little less here. Uh, Frame uh, was born in 33. Uh, he, lower middle class Jewish background, does military service during the early Cold War, learned Russian quite well for intelligence work, wound up translating um, a lot of, of, of Chekhov. Uh, he's probably the most famous current adapter of Chekhov into English. Uh, some of it's quite great. I didn't like, I, I was in London in the fall term on sabbatical. I saw the new three sisters of his, but I didn't love, my wife did. She's a real lit teacher, not a taking like me, so I'll take her word for it. But he's a very, very gifted translator. That would be enough of a career, except he's also, rather bizarrely, equally successful as a novelist and a playwright. Almost unknown, as a matter of fact, in Britain. Uh, the novels are most well, not entirely comic novels, uh, the plays include what is thought by Frank Rich, who is an extraordinarily dyspeptic person, uh, to be the funniest play written since World War II. It's Noises Off. It's a very yeah. great force. Yeah. And Benefactors, I think, uh, is the smartest play written about politics since World War II, but we'll get to that. We'll see if we can uh, if we agree. Uh, but again, with the perversity of the world, he's not famous for this. He's famous for having written a play, I think, is greatly overrated, Copenhagen. I know Copenhagen? Yes. Which is, uh, everyone loves. <coughs> uh, is in print, and there are books about Copenhagen, some of them by Michael Frame. And this, although it was as recently as 2010, revived was in New York, uh, it had a, one famous West End production, which I had the good luck to see in 84. Next year, it came to New York, Sam Waterston played David. And it doesn't seem to have the durability quite of the noises off or for that matter, Copenhagen, although I think it's a better, much better play than either. He did Democracy, which is a strange play about uh, the, a scandal that brought down Willy Brandt in Germany, which has actually rather interestingly been revived very successfully recently in London. So Frame is, <coughs> in addition to that, an immensely successful journalist. He does a lot of reviewing for the TLS. He writes a column, he's got a column on The Guardian. He's done a lot of high-end broadsheet journalism. So he's a multiply successful person. Now the next thing I'd say about this is, I think this play is in certain respects, slightly fascinating response uh, to the real thing, Tom Stoppard's uh, very successful, slightly career changing, still unique in his output play from 1982, which looks at some, anyone know the real thing? It's about to be revived yet again. Uh, some questions about politics, aesthetics, uh, <coughs> for that matter, marriage um, within the context of two marriages. So that it's a play which by British standards, rather weirdly by ours, Tom Sauber is considered almost a conservative playwright because being of Czech origin, he very much disliked the Czech Communist Party and was a great friend of Helsinki before his charter 77. 
this wasn't the flavor of the month in the 70s and 80s in Britain. So the real thing is almost a kind of slightly conservative, by British theater standards, but it inspired two, I think, responses. It's such a successful attempt to work out some political questions in the context of a, what looks like an adultery play. It inspired David Hare, who was one of the Anglo-Marxist playwrights at the time, did a play called The Map of the World, where a sex triangle turns out to be a way of doing some talking about politics. And I think it started in 1984, two years later. But I think this is a play that is a four-hander, economical to produce, no sets of any kind almost, maybe a living room. And it's done pretty much uh, as a play about two marriages and a career-changing uh, misfortune. But I think it's, in fact, a play about why Thatcherism came to power in Britain. And that is very much worth thinking about for a second which is to say, after the 45, the end of World War II, when the British delighted with Winston Churchill having won the world and saved them and everybody else from Hitler, chucked them out immediately as a Tory liberal imperialist and decided to create the modern welfare state. And that survived pretty much intact until 1979, when Thatcher was elected, inaugurating 17 years of Tory rule. She was one of the most divisive figures in British history since, I suppose, uh, Charles I, and in some funny ways, uh, almost exactly parallels in American history, Ronald Reagan on the American New Deal. The New Deal lasts <coughs> from 32, hegemonic really, until, I mean, remember Richard Nixon declared, I'm a Keynesian, tried to get through a negative income tax, and is about 160 degrees to the left of any Democrat who's lived since Harry Truman. That, that New Deal is destroyed within a year of Thatcher by Ronald Reagan. So that something happens in Anglo-American society where two very long-standing, hegemonic, <coughs> somewhat pretentious word, liberal uh, political structures are destroyed. And the destruction may have had long-standing causes, complicated roots. But we associate in both cases this defeat of a liberal social political order with Thatcher in Britain and Reagan in America. Now, Crane was writing this play in a period in which uh, Anglo-Marxist playwrights were extremely effective British play writing tradition. People like David Edgar, who did the Nicholas Nimbley adaptation and a lot about destiny. Um, <coughs> David Hare, who was much to his left. Howard Brenton, almost happily forgotten now. Um, mm -hmm. Howard Barker, almost forgotten, so less happily. But the weird thing about Crane is he's a liberal playwright in our sense of the word liberal. Anyone who knows England who lived there knows we're liberal slightly less positively charged word there, because it's more left uh, literary culture in some ways. Uh, Frayn, I think, despite apparently writing a play about an architect, two marriages, and a housing project, I think has written a play about what happened to the welfare state and what caused its demise. From very early on, <coughs> this is a play from 84, it's looking back only five years. Next thing I would notice about it is that it's, I think, by a man who was a great defender of the order that was destroyed. But it's a much more self-critical, open, self-questioning play, in my view, than most political drama. I think one of the reasons it's not even understood to be openly political drama is its subtlety and the fact that it works out some of these questions, in my view, from the context of what appears to be a kind of double marriage play. Uh, third thing I'd say about it, before saying anything else, is that um, in some ways, uh, things written in the 80s in the high water mark of bitter anti-Thatcherite stuff don't tend to age that well. I think one of the funniest books ever written about study of literature in the 80s was uh, David Lodge's Nice Work. Anyone read Nice Work? I try and teach Nice Work, and it's harder and harder to teach it because kids have no idea what mm -hmm. a Marxist feminist critic of Thatcherism would have been like. I, the fact that it's a rewrite of in some ways, Pride and Prejudice helps a little bit, but not enough. A lot of 80s stuff seems harsh, overly combative. I think this survives pretty well, and one reason, I think, is that we're still playing out some of the things in American politics that he's talking about. But we'll see if we will. So with no further ado, since I'm not supposed to talk with Sarah Lawrence, and I always get some mileage out of this one, what can you do with the title? Benefactors. Well, I mean, it, it, there's irony in the title based on what happened in the play, and that is the, the, the 
assumption that benefactors are doing good when in fact they might not be doing yeah. so good. So it's, it's an ironic title. I think it certainly is. It also, by the way, if you wanted to, I agree that etymologically, uh, people who do good, you know, facio, the Latin has its verb from either make or do, bene, good or well, uh, you might even get more of the charge by translating it rather than do <coughs> good as do gooder. You know, the, the do gooder is a pejorative word in American English. It implies a slightly nosy, Parkerish, <coughs> slightly intrusive, uh, potentially bullying potentially exceeding one's own competence despite one's high opinion of one's own virtue and capacity. Negative virtue. Yeah, I think that the word do-gooder is never said as praise. So like condescension? I think it implies a certain, the, the do-gooder is sometimes at the best intrusive. thought to be meddlesome. Mm -hmm. and, um, the hated hall monitor of high school, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. I mean, the, uh, an interesting, uh, Example in English literature of the do gooder as satiric object would be the Jelly Bees and the Particles in Bleak House, where the do gooder may know far less about the world of the poor which she seeks to assist than she may believe. In the case of Mrs. Particle, there may be a sadism even in the impulse to intervene in and control other people's lives. I don't think that's quite what Frame thinks about David and Jane, the first of the two marriages. But Certainly the title is ironic in some way. Uh, what ways? How is it ironic? Well, I mean, the, the, the thought comes then that the, the supposed intention is good, and part of the irony is that the result may be just the opposite. And then the other part of it, maybe probably it's not as quite the irony, but is the, the uh, benefactor also smacks of, of, of class, yeah. that I am of a class where I can give and do these things and you're not. Yeah. You so, need my right. generous intervention in your incompetent and benighted existence. That's one of, yeah. Which when you think of the yeah. sort of, uh, not ostentatious, but <coughs> very visible philanthropy of uh, Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, and those folks in our time, which some of it is probably really doing some good in Africa and so forth. There's, there's a parallel there, for sure. So, yeah, I mean, it's just a thought to that. Well, I, I think it's actually a good way to go. You know, one of the things about David Kitzinger, who is the architect, is that David's benevolence turns out to be very much in David's own interest. Mm -hmm. Because as Colin, who is his friend and the <coughs> uh, nemesis, nemesis <laughs> says, well, David says, you know, the, what's, what's the neighborhood look like? The neighborhood's called Basuto Road. And a wonderful name. And in fact, the play opens. Uh, and it's a slightly tricky opening. Because this is, in fact, a history play. If you take history play to mean a play where there's a dramatic date that differs from the date of composition, so this produced, meaning the play is written <coughs> at T2, it's set in T1 sometime in the past. This play is mostly set in 1969. It's other parts of it are set in its own present, 1984. And this produces that thing that people in the business call dramatic irony, which is the audience knows something that the protagonists mostly don't know. This is a complicated kind of dramatic irony history play because the opening passages are potentially quite confusing. Because one of the people is speaking, it looks like a conversation. They're standing next to each other. There's nothing on set unless you're being very, very you know, fancy and ambitious to indicate they're not in the same time <coughs> moment. And they appear to be talking about the same thing. David says, Basuto Road, I love the name. Jane, Basuto Road, how oh, I hate those great sour, sour gray words. <coughs> David, Basuto Road, SE15. You know, once you know when it was built and what it looks like, you practically smell the gray lace curtains in those little bay windows. Don't you think, Jane, you look back on life and there's a great chain of cloud shadows moving over the earth behind you. All the sharp, bright landscape you just traveled through has gone gray and graceless Basuto Road. But when you think how fresh and hopeful that must have sounded once, back in 1890. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a joke, of course, because it must have sounded hope once hopeful in 1969. It doesn't sound very hopeful in 1984. <laughs> there's the whole history of ideas in that one name. 
the pseudo road. And she says, Jane, there it is on the box files all along the shelf, the pseudo road, the pseudo road, the pseudo road, gray faced reproachful words shuffling towards you. Now, what you begin to realize at some point, not at the moment the lines are spoken, is that one of these people is looking back from tw you know, 20 almost years distance, not quite 15 years, and the other one is in the moment of 1969. So that it's not a fight between two people having been married to one another, at least not the first scene of the play. You're watching two people address the same event. Now there's a time uh, element. In Stoppard, Stoppard, anyone, how many of you know Stoppard? There's a comic effect that the great French, almost not somewhere on that, theorist of comedy, Henri Bergson, called Interference of Series. And the appearance of series happens when two people are having a conversation, but they're talking about different things, and each thinks the other person is responding to him. But, so they're talking past one another, and they believe they're in the same conversation. And the appearance of series is extremely funny, and Stopper happens to be a genius at it. This is a kind of interference of series, but not the normal kind, because they're merely speaking not to one another. They're not even speaking within 15 years of one another. But you mistake them for doing so as the audience. When David says, Pseudo Road, it looks a little gray, gray and run down, Colin, a little later, will tell you, well, it had best, uh, you'd best succeed, or else the neighborhoods where architects live will start to look a little gray and run down. Remember that joke? What's that joke mean? Yeah, that the benefactor, if he's an architect, working on public money with the power of the law to condemn your housing and force you <coughs> to move into a skyscraper tower block, is doing so with the power of the law on his side. He's being paid by your tax dollars, or in your case, pounds. And it's an obvious paradox. That the person who believes himself to be doing good is, in fact, doing rather well out of it. Now, in Greek, you can't make that mistake quite. Aristotle's eudaimonia tends to mean both doing well and faring well. A friend of mine, this never occurred to me, and it never occurred, I think, to most people I knew when I was at Sarah Lawrence, but people who administer the welfare state are actually making rather handsome living out of it. <laughs> if it <laughs> it's worth thinking about. For example, a friend of mine, an Anglo-Cypriot kid, told me who had gone actually to Cambridge, and his father was a successful former Cypriot terrorist turned discount electronics salesman. But he said, it is a little long. He said that we tax a person who makes 300 pounds a month working on a calf somewhere frying eggs in horrible grease to send a banker's son or daughter to Cambridge. Isn't that odd? You know, Papa has a landed estate and a house in, you know, Jersey <coughs> Kensington, and some poor schmuck in Yorkshire, you know, grubbing about is being taxed. And that we call a progressive distribution of income that education is free. Why should education be free? Since universities in Britain at the time of trains attending it, by the way, until quite recently, were attended by 8% of the population. And they didn't happen to be the people who were the poorest in the land. Now you could say of Frame, he's from a very particular moment in the history of the British university system. He was a <coughs> lower middle class, upper working class kid, goes to a grammar school, a good one, and gets into Cambridge, you know, which you know, great university of the world in most respects. And he does this, he actually went to Emmanuel, which is what it's, you know, vulgar little new world progeny or is in fact part of it. And so he goes to Emmanuel, he makes a perfectly good run of it. And in his case, he's not in fact a, you know, a black cat's <coughs> kid, but he is aware that there's certain paradox. He puts that into the mouth of Colin, who points out that architects make money if the state transfers tax money to them to evict people by way of improving their lives. <coughs> One thing about working people is they really hated living in power blocks. They didn't want to at all. Every English home someone wants to serve is a dime store miniature version of an aristocratic estate. It always has a little garden in front and back, and the main garden is in the back so that the vulgar can't look at you no matter how vulgar you may be yourself. The, the idea of your own home is absolutely central. One of the highest rates of owner occupancy in the the world of the North the United States. And this is a very strange <coughs> system in many ways. We have the same experience. Why did tower blocks, we call them housing projects, go out of fashion? Because they did go out of fashion big time. What's Cabrini Green? Anyone know Cabrini Green? Yeah. 
the Chicago The Chicago, Chicago Housing, Housing Project, Project yeah. it was, finally they had to destroy it because it was thought to produce largely homicide, uh, uh, industrial scale, drug deals at an intergalactic scale, and uh, <laughs> monstrous. Yeah. Yeah. And it was seen to destroy the kinds of possibility <coughs> of ordinary people living with three generations, your grandmother living with you, looking after the kid, that a housing project makes communal self-regulating life the way an urban scene replicated a peasant village with British industrialization in some forms at least of social, you know, self-policing. The housing block, it was decided sometime in the 70s, destroyed all of that. We have a comparable turn in our own urban sociology, but the, the urban project is not a very, very brilliant response. Why would anyone do it then? Well, certainly, so it's gonna, yeah. You know, give give people elevators and yeah. We have ideals about the collective forms of modern urban life. Many of those ideals are, by the way, German and indeed right. Jewish in origin. They're Bauhaus ideals. They're Bauhaus. Yeah. The one anti-Semitic remark that Colin makes in this play. Anyone notice it? Colin gives a press release. Hampstead Architects and. <coughs> Anyone know Hampstead? Yes. Hampstead? Foreign extraction. Foreign extraction. Yeah, a foreign extraction. And that shocks David. He said that. Hampstead, the famous phrase goes, is where arts and tarts meet barts and smarts. <laughs> Baronets and intellectuals meaning women of easy virtue and bohemians and writers. Hampstead is very, very rich. 75 MPs live there. Uh, it also is the richest of the neighborhoods that would have a significant London Jewish population. David's been promoted <coughs> from where he actually grew up. I believe that Michael Frayn grew up in Mill Hill, which is not a particularly classy part of Jewish North London. Um, let me give you an example of what Hampstead is actually like. I lived in Hampstead in a 20 pound bed set when I first lived in England for a year in 1981. My parents came to visit me. My, we went to the high street, I lived up near the Heath, in Christ Church, and my father saw in the high street food shop a scotch egg. Anyone know what a scotch egg is? You <coughs> hard boil an egg, you dip it in raw sausage meat, you dust it in flour, you deep fry it, <laughs> and produced an almost perfect oval of pure cholesterol. <laughs> <laughs> it's heart stopping. And my father, used to, my, father to, my father used to read a fair number of British murder mysteries in which the detective inspector, working class fellow, normally eats scotch eggs. My father wanted to have a scotch egg, and so he bought the scotch egg. He was eating it somewhat meditatively, and the man who sold it to him inquired quite politely, how do you find it, sir? My father, not thinking, said, it's the oyster trim. If you don't know that word, that's a Yiddish word that means overly dried out. And my father, realizing suddenly this wasn't the Bronx he'd grown up in or Chicago, turned upon himself, I'm terribly sorry, you probably wouldn't know that word. The man said, oh no, sir, I know that word. In fact, Hamza is full of people who would know that word, but should never admit it. So that's, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's, the, that's the world that Colin is invoking when he seeks to rouse public animosity. Housing projects, Jews of a rich sort, build them for you against your rule. That's the implication of that. But I do get, I, maybe I misread the play, mm -hmm. but I get that David, in a sense, is a choice for something that's already been designated as going to be done. Yes. So that he's, I don't know that he's a victim, but he's caught in, 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 a, in a, a system beyond well, his Yeah, well, more than that. Yeah, I would say David did he decide. He himself. himself. Yeah, yeah, David yeah. wanted to decide, let's tear down the pseudo rose. Yes. The council, which is a, a democratically elected government, you know, it's, you know, like, you know, it's City Hall, in that London did not in those days actually have a mayor. 60s, and it still, it barely has a mayor, that poor <laughs> now. But you know, this is a county council, it's a fairly, it's a legislature, <coughs> with the ability to make serious decisions with government money as well as ratepayers' money. And what has been done is it's decided that we need to house more people because low rise, you know, what they call terraces and we call semi you know, detached housing, is a very inefficient way of getting lots of housing to people. A lot of housing is destroyed. By World War II bombing, the Germans were, did something in the way of urban renewal, but only on a rather delayed time frame. And London is one of the <coughs> most densely populated. I think it is, in fact, the most densely populated place in, West, in Western Europe. But you probably have to go to Shanghai to find some of the higher population density. 
So the county council wants to house more people, and why not? And they're living in grotty little inefficient slum housing. So it's expensive to maintain. Very expensive to maintain, an extremely inefficient way of providing an urgent social good. And Britain had very generous redistributive social policy. You had a right to housing. And they wanted to house you better. So David would like to build low rise because that's what people want. He's not a monster, but you can't. This is a tiny little space, and it's getting smaller all the time. It turns out that underneath the playground, there's subsidence. You can't even drive a tractor onto it. There's a 275,000 volt cable that goes through more of it. If you don't show a net gain of housing of a serious kind, what would possibly justify the investment of public money or any money? But David is at the <coughs> mercy of rather brutal economic and political factors. He has to build high. Now, as it happens, he doesn't hate the idea of some kind of high because he has a little bit of a modernist aesthetic. Architects tend, for much of the middle of the 20th century, <coughs> to be impressed by modernist ideas. David wants, by the way, though, to build you know, slabs that will turn this community looking inwards yeah. at its own. He makes that comment about the, uh, the British schools. Yeah. And that's, that's how he liked it, was uh, yeah. looking in on ourselves yeah. with the yeah. But in, in other words, Collins says, Actually, Sheila says, oh, it's like your college. And, they, and Colin says, you hit upon one of the fundamental principles of British architecture. <laughs> In other words, everything should be like a Cambridge college. That's true. Yeah. Uh, I, I was thinking about the, in the United States, the housing projects that were built after yeah. World War II, yeah. which were primarily built because GIs coming back yeah. had no place to stay. Yeah. The question was, what could the where, can you go? Where, yeah. where could GIs live? Yeah. How do you get the GI Bill to get people back yeah. to school and back to yeah. work? Because there was a formal industry yeah. for people to work at. But of course, it does create an underclass. Yes. Because you're in a one down position, even though the, the, the government people are grateful for the things that you've done and the sacrifices that you've made. Well, there were theories in both Britain and America after housing projects went out of fashion that said that the architecture itself dissolves and destroys forms of community. Now, whether or not that's true is a very different question. One reason David's a victim of circumstance is he's extremely unlucky. He's trying to build what would be the last housing project, and indeed, it won't be the last. The last one was the one before. The plan will fail. Political opposition, changing fashion. David has not caught a wave. He's, been, he's about to be drowned, by the way. Colin, it's not so obvious. Maybe Colin's perverse destructiveness stops the project from being finished. Maybe not. But things have changed. Nobody's building this for the next 25 years in Britain. That everything changes. Not just Thatcherism, but our aesthetics, our sociology of urban life, lots of stuff changes. The people who move out of those projects with suburbanization leave them to people who come into them into a early post-industrial economy. So if you provided relatively <coughs> decent jobs for the people who came north to pay, pick up those spaces that the GIs left by 52, it's not so clear you'd have a crack in pathology. You might have an urban, well-housed working class. There are plenty of people who lived in high-rise-ish housing. Uh, Vienna, the Karl Markshof, the great social democratic projects were one of the most urbane, civilized working class communities in the history of the human race. So it's not obvious to us. I, mean, I just moved from a brownstone under threat of eviction by my landlord uh, into a higher rise building 41 feet to the east because he was foolish enough to hire a worse lawyer than my sister recommended. But you know, I'm perfectly happy to be in a 17, in a 15 story building compared to a four story building. But there's nothing about, but this is a moment where a set of aesthetic slash political slash cultural slash economic factors have combined to wrong to put David on the wrong foot. And he's yes. But then isn't that sort of the undercurrent of the book for everybody that the of the play that everybody knows that? Like every character in my mind when I read it understands that the idea is wrong. The idea doesn't make sense. And yet the social impact of David's steadfast passes to be on board with this creates that social paradigm because suddenly Sheila finds it very attractive that he has an idea, right? That he's like has some plan, and Colin doesn't seem to, seem to be following along the negativity rather than having his own vision. Well, since that was question. interesting. Colin clearly hates it, right? And Colin is 
you know, okay, what can we say about Colin? Uh, his last name was Molyneux. Look, anyone do anything with that? M-O-L-Y-N-E-A-U-X? Norman, meaning, if you have a very French name in Britain, it's a, it tends to be an indicator of higher social status. <laughs> in fact, the American story, my kin made a Molyneux to Hawthorne story, anyone know that one? Where the young man during the revolution is going to Boston to see his powerful and wealthy kinsman, Major Molyneux, and he's pretty sure he's going to have a good life because Major Molyneux will help him. And he gets to Molyneux who's being driven out of town on a rail by a patriot mob. <coughs> it's a good Hawthorne story about this is not a country for aristocracy, for better and for ill. We have lynchings instead in democracy. I mean, so Hawthorne is not a particularly happy camper in America. But one of the oddities about Colin is he's downwardly mobile. I mean, he must have come from rather grand circumstances, mm -hmm. got the name. But yes, so I mean, my, my reading is sort of, uh, yeah. you know, the comments about, about Cambridge, about their sort of, yeah. uh, their different backgrounds, that, yeah. that he's very much the sort of, um, the aristocrat that's, that's now seeing his world change. Yeah. He likes he likes the smaller streets. He likes yeah. he likes the sort of yeah. the back gardens. And this is the uh, the modern coming in, yeah. uh, in the, the British yeah. modern in that sense, for destroying what he thought was the quaint old England that he loves. Yeah. He, and, and that's kind of that's their their yeah. relationship. I mean, there's this he works for like a publishing yeah. uh, a publishing house. Yeah. It's not. I yeah. mean, it's sort of we came to Cambridge. You know, he's the first time. David ever saw him, he's wearing a scholar's gown. That means that you want a kind of merit yeah. award and you're dressed slightly differently, indicating your intellectual authority. There was some money involved too, but you win it not on need, but based on intellectual achievement in, in a good public school. He was a classicist. The only thing he ever learned that was worth anything, it turned out, was writing Greek hexameters. That turns out to make you very, very good at writing sort of brown shirt style advertising slogans or Le 68 or advertising. As <coughs> Colin says, it turns out that if you can get a thought into three dactyls and a spondy, you're made for this job. But it, that was not anticipated benefit. And in fact, it's not so clear that Colin's going to do very well in modernity. In fact, he's done rather badly. He managed to marry a working class nurse. Mm -hmm. He's lost, lost a number of jobs. He's bitterly at war with his times. Mm -hmm. But at least he can take down David with him, his only friend. When we first see him, he's at this college, he's a, in his gown, he's saying grace, he has a beautiful tie, shirt, a yellow flower in his buttonhole, and no socks or shoes, which doesn't mean he's forgetful. It means that he has a kind of sprezzatura, kind of you know, upper class insouciance that David, David's very s astonishment at that level of playfulness is a class marker too. He doesn't get the joke, he knows there's something <coughs> wonderful here. Why, why does Colin do it? For those who have not been able to get a copy of this, it is out of print for which I apologize. Smash up the project and David's life. And he does, after all, destroy David's life. David spends 10 years trying, almost five years, trying to do something. And he's become <coughs> obsessed by this. And he's been a very promising, successful young architect. And his life has gone to pieces. Why does Colin do it? Well, it doesn't answer the question to say he didn't do so wrong with his wife either. He treated abominably. Yeah, and but, this, yeah. but that, that was the thing. This is a fight that he could kind of he could fight against something. He was losing on all fronts. Yes. So at least he could take up some charge and hold up his, and be a squatter, and he was had some purpose. Well, from being completely outside the flow of modernity, 1969 is. <laughs> so, you know, it's a moment where apparently radical ideas, perhaps of a deeply reactionary kind, can look triumphant. Well, Suddenly, Colin <coughs> isn't some, you know, down, downly mobile cough. He's a brilliant, witty, charming media hero activist. He lucked out for about six months. But I find, I find yeah. that, I find that um, yeah. in itself kind of ironic, though, because yeah. if he is the sort of comes from these sort of errors, uh, mm -hmm. this sort of background. Yeah. He would instinctively be against it as a Brit. That that sort of um, standing up and being sort of in the light, like being in the light, like sort of, and he's using these very modern tools to do something that he's kind of instinctively against. He's almost like a counter-revolutionary, it seemed to me. Um, the Labour Party politician Tony Benn lost the leadership fight to Dennis Healy. You remember Tony Benn? Uh, Tony Benn, 
leader of the most left faction of the Labour Party, a crucial moment in electoral history, 1982. Anyone know Tony Benn at birth? Anthony Wedgwood Benn. Have to, had to give up the title to even take a seat in the House of Commons. You know, upper class leftists are not completely unknown to us. I seem to remember some. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, so I mean, the, the, it's his moment. And also, there's something strange about the late 60s that would suggest that someone like Colin could briefly mistake himself for, and more widely be mistaken for, something very different. And it's an interesting. Hitler, by the way, hated modernist architecture. Hated a flat roof above all things. <coughs> you know, most Bauhaus is elsewhere now because it became illegal under the Nazis. You know, the school moves five or six times. They come here, where they go to Tel Aviv, which is a world historical site. They actually Bauhaus. don't. They don't own their own name in Germany. Yeah. It's a. Uh, it's basically a Kia yeah. of Germany it owns yeah. the name to Bauhaus. Yeah. So the actual Bauhaus yeah. museum yeah. is has to sort of be yeah. Bauhaus. Yeah. Not no, affiliated with the yeah, old the superstore. Yeah. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it is a kind of doing for other people something that they ought to like but didn't always. On the other hand, as you pointed out, you know, there are reasons why it's necessary to do what Dave was trying to do in order to house more people. And in addition, the only working class person of the four is Sheila. <coughs> and that what Sheila says is, don't ask me what I want. Of course I don't want anything new, I'm fearful, I'm frightened. They probably didn't want to live in the pseudo road they, you know, when they were fresh off the disenfranchised peasantry. You know, tell me what I'm going to live in. Pick the color in the kitchen. That's the great ugly secret, is that we don't know what we want, most of us. But Colin and Jane and David are educated people. Colin and Jane are probably upper middle class people. In the British sense of upper middle class, that means simply not titled. <laughs> but potentially very, very sophisticated and wealthy. But she was the only one of the lot. And Sheila, rather movingly, David says of Sheila, or Jane, I don't remember which says of it, Sheila becomes convinced that high rise housing for working people is the best possible solution. And somebody says of her, I think it's David Jane, hope you can't stamp it out. You wipe it out, somebody it just pops up again. You know, th th there is some part of Sheila. Sheila knows something. She's the last person on the play of the four whom you realize is a much more complicated person than you thought. One of the problems with benefactors, Colin thinks, is that they tend to believe, they always forget that other people's lives, as he says to Jane, are at least as complicated and unique as, as, as your own. That anyone who seeks to benefit <coughs> others assumes a great knowledge of that person greater than they attribute to that person herself. That's probably true of benefactors. But it doesn't mean that the benefactor is wrong, as Sheila points out. Sheila may be in love with David. That's the damning, most destructive thing said by Colin. She even admits it, by the way. But it doesn't mean that she's judging housing projects because she's in love with the architect. She knows something about who she is, indecisive, undereducated, desperately in need of assistance, and grateful for it. Even the thing that changes Sheila briefly, having a job, meaning having charge of something, is nonetheless given to her by someone else's benevolence. Mm -hmm. yeah. First James, then David's. People who need help, need help, and they're grateful <coughs> for it. They so may not always be grateful. the only one who yeah. really yeah. Um, chooses to be in touch, more in touch with mm -hmm. her needs. Yeah. And the rest are all mm -hmm. so focused mm -hmm. on what's going out Outside of yeah. Well, it's just a question. Jane, I think, is a quite interesting character. Because right, if you were to say that Thatcherism destroys the British welfare state, you'd be right. If you were to say that it in many ways wrecks the British economy yet further, you'd be right. Is it an unmitigated disaster? Who does well in this play out of Thatcherism? Anybody? Other than Thatcher? Well, Thatcher isn't in the play, other than yeah, the right. background figure. Anybody's life better at the end of the play than in the beginning? In any way better? Oh, Sheila, maybe because she has a certain uh, independence. At least she's yeah. out of a very destructive marriage she's yes. seeing a psychiatrist. But and has a job. And has a job. Has a job. Yeah. But Jane has a rather good job. And Jane had no job at all at the beginning of this play. Jane has a very good degree in anthropology from an excellent Cambridge college. We don't know which one, but let's assume 
You're going to say King Zeno. <laughs> <laughs> no, they wouldn't have been women. Oh, but she enough. might be Lady Margaret Hall. Something like that. Or Nuno or something. Yeah, okay. So, you know, I mean, she's, and she's a housewife. She does unpaid work for her husband, of a rather demanding clerical and interview survey sort, for which she gets nothing. Her, and, and by the end of this play, she's a high-powered executive in a foundation that restores and rehabilitates <coughs> housing. She's done very well indeed. In fact, what happened under Thatcher and after? Because the labor government that followed Thatcher, meaning Tony Blair, is not particularly different from Thatcher's government in many respects of social and economic policy. What was, who did better? in any way at all. Ugly fact, under Reagan too. Women did better. Feminism triumphs under, in both America and Britain under Reagan and Thatcher. But, you know, the nuclear family with a sole male head of household tends to become a thing of the past by the 1990s. Is that a social policy choice made by Thatcher and Reagan? Absolutely not. It's a consequence of things which they, in theory, are deeply opposed to. The fact is, you know, at some level, Jane's life is much, 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 much better. She's working for herself. She's supporting the entire family since she's the only one who's earning real money. Her husband is, <coughs> by this point, a complete failure economically as an architect. She has self-respect that earning your own living and having people work for you does tend to give you. But there's a friend of mine, uh, a guy named Colonel Ralph Peters. You probably don't read the newspaper unless Ralph has a column because they tend not to be in the broadsheets of America. But Ralph once said the only place he'd been in 70 countries, I think, when he was in the service, he'd ever met a female general was Britain or America. And you know, now you might say that generals are not a socially desirable human type and making women do the job too is not a net gain for human progress, but most women don't see it that way. You know, they like the idea that if anyone's going to be a general, they should have a shot. But, you know, that, that feminism triumphs in this play. It's a weird, ironic fact that David's liberal household as James says, it was he was the leader of the government, I was the leader of the opposition. We each had one vote, one against one for, motion carried. But this is a marriage that, although very happy in some ways, was a product of profound unjust inequality. And that marriage is now over by the, sorry, it's radically transformed by the end of the play. But Jane's success is an irony that I think, an irony of Michael, that Michael Frayn's interested in. How is it that under the most reactionary and barbarous political arrangements we can think of, feminism triumphed in Northwest Europe and America, and didn't triumph in socialist countries like France under Mitterrand, where, you know, again, there's no reason to know this, but feminism in France was astonishingly weak as a socially transformative movement in the 1970s, <coughs> other than as a bunch of university-based Columbusizing. But there's a paradox. Some people lose, some people gain in any historical change. Women actually gained in some ways, I think Crane suggested. Complicated ways. What does Collins say? He loves the idea. The housing project that physically disintegrated in the East End of London, killing people, is the one that he refers to as a, it had a, David says that there was a progressive collapse. Mm. Uh, we understand yeah. what that means, progressive collapse, that the building is held up by each unit supporting the one on top of it. Yeah. And if there's one that collapses, they will eventually all collapse. Effect, yeah. So the failure is a function of a fundamental mistake. Now, it becomes cumulative. It becomes cumulative. This, David says, can't happen because his building will be steel framed. Although it happened in your lifetime, it happened to the World Trade Center, which was also still framed. And the reason it happened to the World Trade Center is that the temperatures they calculated for could never have been achieved without a modern jumbo jet having a full fuel tank produce that much heat energy. You could you could crash. They knew you could crash planes into skyscrapers when they built the World Trade Center. Anyone see that picture of a B-25 crash into the world into the Empire State Building? Mm -hmm. it happened during World War II, actually. But if you'd, hit a, if you'd hit the World Trade Center with a Boeing 707, it would have survived. It was this peculiar, horrible, bad fortune that you could get that much energy turned into heat. But the building David has built can't fall down. It didn't help it politically that a building did fall down just the year before. What does Colin like about the phrase progressive collapse? He's not interested in architectural physics. What does he like about the phrase progressive collapse? Oh, collapse of progressives. It's a collapse of the progressives. I mean, the fact is it's progressive collapse because each one falls down in sequence. 
But progressivism as a political movement is collapsing, and every single feature of British society, the common values, seems to be collapsing in turn. The nuclear family, patriarchy, the reign of the humanities over the engineering world, the reign of traditional elites over these oiks who are coming up, and eventually people like David, that there'd be a collapse of progressivism, just as there's been a progressive collapse of everything Colin cared about. That he, he's smart, and he's attuned to the linguistic play. He's quite intrigued by the notion of progressive collapse. Progress is actually a rather interesting word. Anyone, I mean, New Yorkers in the room? Okay, anyone see that thing in the Whitney called This Progress? No, yes? No, I saw it. I, I don't live there anymore. Okay, because yeah. I was actually in that rather weirdly. This Progress was a weird thing done by a pretentious German uh, in which you walk into the Whitney and a little kid said, Mr. and Miss, what's progress? And you would start to talk to the little kid because you're polite. And then you, somebody would be following you, he even knows it was about 19. The after, sorry? The Guggenheim. Sorry? The Tino Segal. Yeah, the Tino thing. Yeah, I was the youngest of the old farts uh, when I got in the job, right. despite not being quite old enough. And at the top of the spiral, you would step out and then engage the person who talked to three other members of different generations about the idea of progress. So I meant to, because they were paying me every some modest sum to think a lot about progress. Well, progress is an implied teleology of history. It's a pretty recent idea, it's 18th century. The notion that history inevitably <coughs> produces by some internal dialectical energy, superior form of life in the future is a relatively recent idea which we happen to have outlived. That Michael Frayn, nothing about the welfare state or American New Deal was supposed to ever go backwards. I remember understanding first the civil rights movement, then American feminism, then gay rights as logical consequences of New Deal politics. New Deal politics has lots of consequences of other forms of democratic energy. If you believe that history only can go one way and that would be upward, you're a progressive, you believe in progress. One of the things that Thatcherism and Reaganism made people reflect upon if they were very reflective was maybe not. Maybe there isn't any direction of history. Maybe there isn't any arrow of time. One of the things that benefactors does, I think, is at least reflect upon because Frayn sees it coming. That's a downfall? Well, that there's no way that we can say history is going our <coughs> way forever, no turning back, or even that history is going anyway. But certainly the notion of some inevitable progress, that that idea has collapsed, that that idea we should have seen by 84, I think Frank is saying, that, it, that, there, that one can't hold that naively optimistic view about the arrow of time. Now, he sees it after Thatcher's first re-election victory after the Falklands War. She'll be elected some more, and then her successors, they'll be in power for 17 years. Their, their successors are never able to return to the welfare state that Thatcher destroyed, not wrong. So that everybody got the inevitable direction of history wrong. They probably got wrong the notion of inevitable direction. Now, what people tend to do, in my experience of them, is they swap inevitable direction. They never get the idea. But if you believe that progress is inevitable, now you decide the future will inevitably be a Chinese kleptocracy of brutal and cynical character. You know, that most people I know who no longer believe in American hegemony believe in Chinese hegemony, and they're not terribly cheerful about it. The idea that the Chinese are far less likely to succeed than we are, since they're a regime inflicting ecocidal damage on themselves with a banking system about as economically sound as the tulip mania in Holland and the logistic <laughs> crisis from hell. <laughs> they managed to piss off you know, everybody around them with a genius achieved previously only by Bill Holm II in 1913. I mean, they are, but people don't think that way. They think, well, we were number one, we'll be number one. Ah, oh, oops, sorry. The, trend, the people are always confident they can tell the inevitable future, even though they're willing to shift the contents of the inevitable. I think Frame is more modest about that. He simply says, the future is not the absolutely confident progressive future that you would have believed if you were born in 33, got to Cambridge in 52, and lived through the great rise of the British welfare state. That's not the obvious future. There isn't an obvious future. And even the valence of it, which way it'll go, is tricky. Jane's tricky. What do you guys think of this point? I'm sure you're <coughs> it's a Sarah Lawrence seminar. I shouldn't be talking this much. <laughs> I thought it was interesting, though, in that sort of vein, though, that there is a sort of 
cyclical nature as well, because the very name should tell you that this place is going to fail. Basuda Road? Yeah, it, it, how well, I mean, it's Basuda Road. Basuda uh, Road. Basuda Road. 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 Yeah. Okay, what's that We've done this before, yeah. mm -hmm. and okay. it's not worth All right, that, thank you. What's that joke mean, Basuda Road? By the way, you know something really quite darkly funny? Is that it, Basuda Road is a real road, and when David says there's the history of an idea in that phrase, he means this was the period of liberal expansion of the liberal empire in the late 19th, early 20th century. By the act, by act <coughs> two, David and Jane are referring to the people who live there, these working class and Afro-Caribbean immigrants, as the Basutos. Mm -hmm. Basutos are an African tribe. You know, there is still a Basuto left. Uh, so there's something to joke about imperial, liberal imperialism the latest form of which is Arch Hampstead Architects of Foreign Extraction, run and Harold Wilson. I mean, that's, I think, part of the joke. Now, it's certainly true that empires rarely work out exactly as their planners suggest. That's true. I think more revelatory is the idea of moving. It's not your fault it was called the Pseudo Road. It's your fault if you, feel, if you call people who work there the Pseudos. I mean, that's, that's a pretty telling remark. James says something interesting. Jane gets the first soliloquy, I think, of the play. And you're hearing her talk about when she goes out to that house, how, that street, to ask people, what do you want? What do you need? And she says, she gives you that long monologue. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a convention in drama that if someone is soliloquizing, at least they think what they're saying is true because there's no one to lie to. So when Richard III tells you in soliloquy something, he's telling the truth to the best of his knowledge. If he's talking to anybody else, he's lying. I mean, that, so, mm -hmm. we, so we may assume, and that, by the way, when Sheila gets her first long soliloquy, you realize that Sheila is a much more complicated person. She has no reason to conceal anything anymore. When Jane does it, she talks about the first house she knocks on. The woman enters the door, hears Jane say, well, you, we're just taking a housing survey to find out what kind of place you'd like to live in. And the woman says, sorry, ma'am, we're all labor here, and slams the door. Mm -hmm. What's that mean, sorry, ma'am, we're all labor here? Mm -hmm. Got a guess on that? When do you say, sorry, we're all labor here? Mm -hmm. Political polling. Season. Political mm -hmm. canvassing. It's, a, it's yeah. an election, yeah. and someone comes to ask for your vote. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm a Democrat. I'm sorry, sorry I'm, I'm a Democrat. Democrat. Now, why would you say, when someone asks you about your housing, yeah. uh, sorry, we're all labor here? There's a woman in the house making a mistake. Well, maybe it's a mistake, and maybe it's not. I mean, maybe it's seeing into the question well, like, okay, you're going to meddle with my house. Well, except the asking. council is a labor council. So it, at one level, and Jane is almost certainly a labor voter, she's been mistaken for a Tory. Mm -hmm. Why? Maybe it's the class. What about the class? Well, I think you identify her as an Oxcambridge graduate yeah, or yeah. something of the sort. And, and she doesn't know about that accent. <coughs> she speaks received pronunciation. In fact, they all do, except for Sheila. Does receive pronunciation, or standard English as we call it, means upper middle class diction in Britain. It's a big deal. It happens to be not quite the same now. In the upper middle class people speak a fake dialect called Estuarine, which is a sort of pseudo working class speech. I remember the first time I heard Estuarine, a friend of mine, John and Gary Stephen Jones' son, who came up from Oxford with his first girlfriend, a girl named Daisy. Daisy sounded like a doctor. And I said to Gareth, what, what does Daisy's dad do? I'm just curious. And Gareth said, head of the Royal Valley. <laughs> you know, so the, you know, it, it, it's a kind of, we did this a little bit when we were in college. You occasionally would speak a little down market, but it's a little lot. They didn't do it, by the way, in 1969. So this is pure accent. Is, and the odds are very great. But if you have Jane's accent, you're a target. And who knows where Jane will be in 10 years, by the way. Who knows where Jane will be by the time she's running that rehabilitation housing project. Rehabilitating housing means kicking working people out of it, making it very nice, and now a guy in the hedge fund lives there. I mean, that's, of course, what Fulham was a working class district. I lived there in last semester in a friend's house. Fulham is not a working class district now. Gentrification, what Jane is doing, is, a, is not a net gain for human felicity. It's a net gain for architectural preservation. That's rather a different thing. Next person, though, she bumps into, she says, a woman with children all over her like oranges on a tree. And she laughs and she laughs. 
and I realize she doesn't understand a word I'm saying. She doesn't know my dialect. That's an interesting thing to say. Who says a uh, received pronunciation, cut glass accent, but it's a dialect? That's what it is, by the way. What's a, you don't normally say in upper class English, it's a dialect. Who does say that? Anthropologists. Anthropologists say that. Yeah, I mean, she's an anthropologist. She has a degree in anthropology. She may be an upper class, upper class person. She has a rather technically sophisticated understanding of, of, of language and class. It's a dialect. There's a famous joke, by the way, a wonderful joke. A dialect is a, a, is a language with an army of its own. Meaning the people, what we call French, was spoken by a tiny number of people in the Ile de France, and nobody else in France understood a word of what they were saying. And by 1920, they would managed to wipe out every other kind of French. There's a very interesting book about this, <coughs> that's the defense of my usual level. But what has happened, Jane is sophisticated about this. She knows, I speak a dialect of English. Jane, by the way, will not, um, that's actually an interesting question. Colin says to Jane a very interesting thing. <coughs> Jane says to Colin, after he started this, after he's given the interview to the paper, after he's set in motion the crisis that will destroy her husband's livelihood, she says, Colin, there's something about you. I'm going to tell you a secret. I'm going, and he says, what, you fancy me? And she says, no, I don't like you. What kind of people, by the way, is it the greatest secret that they don't like you? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly a middle class show. I mean, the famous rule. Um, there are a couple of wonderful definitions of gentlemen in Britain, and one of them is a gentleman is someone who is never unintentionally rude. And so, you know, Jane is not the kind of person who would tell you she doesn't like you. I mean, she, you know, it's, had, this man had been her husband's best friend. They've known each other since they were eight, 19, and she's never liked him. David says, I like you, Jane. We share something. There's a darkness in you. Is that true? But Jane? Is there a darkness in Jane? Well, she does what you should do. If someone's in trouble, you help them. You don't have to like them. In fact, they're probably not very likable. When the woman says, the third she woman. She may not like doing it. No, but she'll she do it. aggravated yeah. about having yeah. to do it. And the, first, the third person says, <coughs> my mother's fallen. I can't lift her. And it's, of course, it's not just getting up she needs. The woman presumably lost, was incontinent as well. Mm -hmm. But Jane will do whatever you need to do for others is an admirable quality. It's not liking them that counts. Mm -hmm. It's doing the right thing. Jane may have a darkness in her, but she doesn't let that darkness. That may be what we can expect. It may be, by the way, a more durable form of virtue <coughs> than David's virtue. David is, in some respects, it seems to me, an unwittingly comic character. There's something hilarious about David. He cannot understand the presence of evil in the world. He can't understand why Colin's doing it. He doesn't even believe that he should try and stop Colin. For one thing, he's too confident he'll win no matter what, because his progress is on his side. But <coughs> even afterwards, he can't understand Colin. This makes Jane crazy. Jane understands evil. She didn't realize quite how evil Colin was, but there's some evil there. But if you can't imagine evil, maybe you're a very sensitive person, that you probably shouldn't do politics. Yeah. <laughs> even, even at the level of being an architect for a London working class county council. Well, I, am, I was struck by the yeah. difference between uh, how David came to the decision to build the two big towers. Mm -hmm. First, you know, a certain number of towers at one point. He wants height, to build low rise to the gates. Fewer towers yeah. a little bit yeah. higher, and then he saw it, the vision, okay. the two towers. And so there was this dialectic okay. there. Whereas <coughs> when Colin woke up in his squat, in yeah. his camping bed. Yeah. He wasn't sure why he was doing any of it. I mean, he never quite knew, it seemed. And, and yet, his conviction, I mean, his use as progressive collapse, as working of public opinion, proved to be much more effective than David's kind of rational certainty that, you know, given the cables and the power and everything, it has to be too. too Okay, I would say, let's take those two in turn. I think that's very interesting. Yeah. David, it seems to me, convinces himself yeah. that high building high is the answer. 
but in fact, there is no other possible solution to the problem. You have to show a net gain in housing or the council won't pay for it. The government won't agree with the ministry will pay wash it. So what David persuades himself is the only possible approach is indeed the, the best approach. He'll build the biggest housing, public housing in Europe. Now a friend of mine, you actually know him, Phil Freeman, well, uh, we have a friend common who they, they're both psychiatrists, <laughs> and my friend who was in, living in California in the 70s said that Strangely enough, once the insurance companies stop paying for enough psychiatry of the talking cure kind, they, the psychiatrists happily invented a doctrine that the talking cure didn't help. That, the, that first the material world changes and the ideological stuff follows in its train. This is a familiar explanation of porn. It's called orthodox Marxism. And the case of the DSM-3, <laughs> there's something to be said for it. In David's case, you know, he talks himself into something which turns out to be materially produced and inevitable. Yeah. Now, there's a part of David that likes low rise, because he has his little William Morris arts and crafty streak. There's part of that that likes high rise, he's got his townhouse streak. He can go either way. Most of us are fairly eclectic in our case there. We can, like, you know, Colin, who is more like Prince Charles, he hates and detests anything new, at least can tell every street in London has identical doors of terraced houses inhabited by young bankers, and he wants to tear them all down and build some skyscrapers, because Colin has a contrarian, perverse streak in it. But I, I would say that David, I don't think David, I think David's consciousness is an epiphenomenal to the material forces that control what he's allowed to do. Now, what was the second question about Colin? He doesn't know why he's doing it? Well, he doesn't know. David thought he, thought he knew, and, and yeah. Colin okay. I think he doesn't. If Colin reminds me of anybody in this respect, it's Yago. We have no idea. Colin Everell does betray his only friend. It turns out that everybody hates <laughs> Colin except David Kitzinger. <laughs> that, that, that at a certain moment, Jane and Sheila, I think, reveal to us that they don't know. Sheila tells Jane they, that Colin doesn't have any friends anymore. He keeps getting fired. He's an extremely difficult, not pleasant person. Now, are Dave and Jane's friends? For, well, Jane's not his friend. It turns out Jane never liked him. Why is David his friend? Well, David apparently loves everybody. He's congenitally incapable. Dislike. He doesn't have the. Now, there may be other explanations. We're given a little hint when Colin says we were in Greece together and David said, I won't marry her, I won't, I won't, I won't. Well, her was Jane. Does that mean there was some homoerotic thing? Who knows? Between, uh, we don't even know anything about this. We, we're given lots of little teases about what kind of a person this is. We've discovered as the play goes on that both marriages are much more complicated. But I do think, you know, at the end of a fellow, Yago says, I'm never going to tell you why I did it. And they say, torture me, and we'll find out. But we never get to discover torture is not infallible. I mean, we don't know why. I think. Now, another, maybe Yago is wrong. Anyone know Coriolanus or Alphidius, the head of the, I think, Vivalski, is Somebody says, how come Coriolanus betrayed the Romans for us? And Alphidius says, well, maybe it's this, and then maybe it's this, maybe it's this, maybe it's this, maybe it's this. A friend of mine, a very clever man, became President Amherst at one point, said, that means that he has no idea. <laughs> that he can provide five possible explanations for why someone did something. We have no idea. So I think that we don't know. Did Colin do it out of socially downwardly mobile resentment of the young immigrant Jewish kid who's rising in the world and everything's on his side? Did he do it because he had a yen for a woman of his own class and religion? who David got in college, that's possible. I mean, he's known Jane, he's even flirting with Jane when she comes to visit him in the squad. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that why? Does he do it because his wife's in love with Jane? With, sorry, with, with David. He knows this, that she was, and even if you don't love her, even if you've been happy with her for four weeks out of 15 years, nobody likes, I think, their wife falling in love with their you know, Anyone else? Well, especially Anyone else. They're the friend for whom they have a fair amount of intellectual and psychological contempt. I, mean, I think we're given lots of possible explanations. Or, does, as Kevin suggested, does at some level Colin have a genuine, even morally interesting and aesthetically impressive loathing of housing projects? He doesn't like that. Also, you don't have to be reductionistic. Yeah. All of those reasons. Yeah. In different ways and mm -hmm. different times mm -hmm. for their own complicated reasons. Mm -hmm. And they all exist side by side. Yes, so I think that's true. And that human motives are complicated. 
And if human motives were simpler, then liberal politics would be easier. <laughs> and then, then, then much of what we learn. Yeah, that's why it is yeah. because there are two things that are happening at the same time or more. And we need that we all. So the lesson to try to come to grips with that sort of confusion and ambiguity and lack of clarity. And David, we don't know. Yeah. David believes that the world is a more straightforward place than it is. Liberal politics probably at some level always assumed the world was a more straightforward place than it was. This doesn't mean that Collins' hostility, his negation, is an adequate political response mm -hmm. to the problems of liberalism. It just doesn't. Nor does it mean that <coughs> even what Jane does, there's a great irony that Jane's, Jane will help build the London that I just lived in last semester, in which you can't hear an English accent for, ten, for five miles. It's entirely <laughs> taken up by the world's rich. We don't want to afford to live there. You have to go south of the river before you hear a British accent again. Mm -hmm. I, I, my association was yeah. at one point in New York City when everything was being yeah. sort of covered by concrete. Yeah. The idea was to build a taller skyscraper yeah. so you actually could have some grass somewhere yeah. and some trees somewhere so there would be a balance between the yeah. numbers of people that you had to house and remembering that there's a world of your own. No, I, I think that there are costs to the world David will create, and there are costs to the world that will replace it. That you know, there, and there are ironies, dark and unanticipated ones from all sides. I think that one of the things I admire about this play is I think that Frame looks at a political defeat suffered by his side, and his first question isn't how did those sinister bastards, you know, trick us. It's what was it in what we did that is implicated in our political defeat? That it's a much more... How did we defeat ourselves? Yes, it, it's, it's self... It's, it's, you know, it's curious and self-critical. Mm -hmm. And this is not a common tendency in politics. It's just... Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> no, it's not. Well, it's all about play. Yeah. Yeah, what else about play? It's a rich and intricate play. I mean, I think one of its successes comes from the fact that it talks about quite serious, abstract, questions in the context of a tiny little domestic drama. Two, two, <laughs> two, four actors, two families, and something that happened 15 years in the past involving a building that didn't get built is not the most promising way to describe the collapse of a political tradition, but I think it works. And I think one of the reasons it's a good political play is it's not, you would not necessarily walk into it or even out of it, certainly you've seen a political play. <laughs> I think you've, yeah. um, you know, we all think you I wonder what your thoughts are about the replication of the, the internal dramas between the people and their political positions. So the narrow way that we think about how we're going to solve problems and how we see the world around us, does that play out in this way? There's, there's a relation between one's psychology and one's politics? Yes. Okay. I You're speaking to a psychiatrist. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know for the I, a friend of mine. Yeah, a friend of mine. <laughs> a, a friend of mine once said that a very clever friend that we used to teach the sort of history of great books at Columbia for about five years, and he's now here as we hope to learn. And he said, you know, that one of the strange things about modern liberalism, he and I were both modern American liberals, sort of. You know, uh, he said, is that we. In, the first thing we used to do was we'd spend eight hours teaching the the public, eight one-hour classes, and then we'd wind up somewhere in the early 20th century, a lot of Freud and then some Vader. And I remember Phil said, you know, that every politics presupposes an epistemology, and that the fact that some but not many can know with certainty makes for, this is a vulgar thing to say, but makes for the possibility of philosopher kings, if they in fact are possible. But the, the fact that most people can't know with certainty means that the democracy is predicated on a very dodgy basis. And he said that the thing about modern American liberalism is we've kept the theoretical political psychology that makes democracy seem sensible, but we're actually all Freudians now, so we believe in dark instincts unknown to those possessed by them. That there is an intricate tension between our Epistemology, our psychology, and our liberal politics. That that doesn't mean that we follow our psychology into a kind of 
you know, dark, necessarily skepticism about politics. It just means there's <coughs> I think that Michael Train has rendered a man of great simplicity, that would be David, who he's re and he's rendered a woman of great sophistication, that would be Jane, whose politics are a little hard to pin down because she believes herself. There are many things that we believe, we would like to believe, even if we can no longer do so, and we are not willing to believe their opposite. And I think that's probably where Jane is, generally. Might even be where David is, although less intelligent. Colin? I don't know what Colin is. Sheila seems to me, the more she gets to think about it, the more convinced she is that 60s welfare liberalism is the most humane, just, necessary form of political life. And she's the only one who will ever actually have her fate determined by it. So I don't think that it has simple correspondences to play between the political positions taken by the characters and their own political, their own psychology. I think it is very interested in certain psychological propensities that matter for the plausibility of liberalism. An inability to grasp evil, an inability to grasp the complexity and darkness of, and intricacy and no, and no ability of human motive. That liberalism as a politics may not accord very well with our sense of the complexities of human psychology. I think Frame might believe that. But I don't think he's doing, like, who's the guy who may have just died at Yale? Um, did all those late 60s books on student radicals from a friendly, semi perspective. Uh, Price, he, sorry? No, 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 it was a man. Uh, he then got interested in, in uh, genocide and interested in nuclear weapons. Uh, he's a member of the Great and the Good. Um, has a house up in Truro. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Robert J. Yes, Robert J. Lifton. Yeah. Lifton had a period of trying to correlate in a slightly crude way politics yeah. and religious technology. You get a lot more of that on the right in the late 60s. It took a while until he got to Churro. <coughs> Sorry? Well, it took a while until he got to Churro. Yes. Yeah. Oh, he moves up more slowly? <laughs> then we can pull up. Yeah, let okay. yeah. okay. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, Really, because she, did she marry Sarah Lawrence Yes, she Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, I've met her slightly. She, yeah, yes. Married a literature professor. Yes, no, uh, he's a good kid. And it's, I don't think it's that kind of okay. vulgar liftonism, but I think that it's deeply interested at a more abstract and collective level about paradoxes between what we mm -hmm. think our politics are and what our psychology actually is in terms of what doctrines we subscribe to. Does that make sense? Anybody else? What raises the question, do you think there is a parallel when you ask about it? Do you think there is a, a parallel between psychology and political statements? Or do you see? Well, I think, it's all, I think it's layered and complicated. So I think that there are elements that mm -hmm. are the ways that we think about people and solving problems in ourselves. And there's a certain idealism that we have. And if we create a vision of who we think we are, and we create a vision of who I think you are, and then I try to listen to you as you describe who you think you are. And there's this wonderful disjunction between um, what we imagine and what is real. The lenses. The lenses. The lenses. The lenses. Yes. Mm -hmm. I create, seem to create a reality that is in being there. Yes. But it's always, your vision seems real to you. Your oh. vision of yourself, just as Bob's yeah. vision yeah. of himself and of you seems totally real to him. Sure. Yeah. No, there's a joke. And you're both right. <laughs> there's a joke in the real thing, the Stoppard play, where Henry, the Stoppard surrogate, says, "Public postures take the configuration of private derangements." And his <laughs> not very smart actor friend, whose wife he's sitting with, says, "Who said that?" And rather annoyed, Henry says, "I did." <laughs> <laughs> what that means is, it's not it's not as smart as you think it is, but that's because you're rather stupid. <laughs> 
Yeah, I'm screwing your wife. You, you don't yeah. realize it yet. But, 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 but I don't think that Frame believes that public postures take in any one-to-one -one corresponding way the configuration of private derangements. But then again, I don't think Henry believes that exactly either. Henry thinks that it might be worth exploring. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, maybe Frank thinks that too. They're both great playwrights. Mm -hmm. You know, what it's worth, I suppose you could, you could suggest that, that maybe David, beyond being simple, he certainly mm -hmm. feels simple, could be naive, right? Yes, yeah, so I think he is And idealizing mm -hmm. instead of being, mm -hmm. and, and living out his, his impression of the world as a kind and safe place. I think he, yes, I think that's right. Now, it may, it's interesting to consider that a little bit in some of its implications. So one would be that the world has been going David's way. I, I would say that to be a Jewish kid with a Cambridge architecture degree in 1968 <coughs> that would have been a pretty good place and time to be who you are. And it's about to get a little worse. <laughs> you know, and so, but that, you know, also, you know, David's inability, I mean, the, 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 the people who built the British welfare state and its policy of generous meritocratic admission to Cambridge, they made a pretty safe world. It didn't last forever, but human things don't last forever. You know, the, and we may mourn the world they built. It may be that it didn't have to be as completely altered as it was. I don't know the frame would say that Thatcherism was inevitable and necessary. In fact, I'm fairly sure he wouldn't say that. No, but I think that, that the idea of David's, <coughs> the inability to imagine evil is in some respects, by some perspectives, a radical failure. Yes. And from other perspectives, not so much. <laughs> you know, that, um, I mean, people who can only see the darkest possibilities I mean, some part of calm, I think you get the impression, is produced by his comic relishing of a perverse reading of things. He can rather wittily summon up the worst possibilities. He's also a rather awful person in some ways. That, I mean, not only, but in part. David, I mean, Jane, I suppose, seems to me the kind of gold mean. I mean, she, she can imagine quite vividly things as they are. Yeah, but, I mean, all right, sorry, let me do this slightly different thing. My apology, I'm wandering. I don't know if there's any reason for you to know this. There's a, Henry IV, um, part one, oh, has a character who is the uncle of Hotspur uh, and his Worcester. And Worcester sees with great and terrible clarity that if you help a man kill a king and become a king, he will never forget that you're the one who did it and he will destroy you. Now the problem with that point of view, it's very intelligent, but insofar as you believe it, you must then betray that king and force him to kill you. But if you see a thing with too much clarity, you can make it inevitable, and it wasn't inevitable. So the, the level of dark vision that some people have in politics may in fact produce the world they're seeking to escape from. I mean, that, so, I mean, I, I think that Sheila, testimony in favor of David, maybe we should take that a little seriously because she's had some time to reflect on it when she's looking back at him. And I don't think this is just sexual enthusiasm. I think she's reflecting on what kind of world has come, what kind of world was, what's best for people like her, because most people are like her. And maybe that the British welfare state in some respects was one of the most humane and decent forms of human life we've ever seen. You know, that's possible. A guy who just died wasn't a particularly nice man all the time, Tony Judd. Near the end of his life, wrote a couple of essays suggesting exactly that. That if you could have picked the best time to be a very clever working class 19-year-old, it would probably be 1964. And it would probably be in England. <laughs> you know, that, that was a very, in some, if you were clever, just society. And it was quite different in Britain, wasn't it? Because they didn't have the Vietnam War. So in the yeah. States, we had kind of darkness that yeah. led to this massive rebellion and, yeah. and, and upheaval, social upheaval. But 
didn't really have, it's kind of a sweet world still in Britain. Well, again, it's a question of, you know, you take your pick, right? The, the, only 8% of people went to university in Britain, when 44% went to okay. America. On the other hand, Americans call stuff universities that Brits wouldn't even call teacher training colleges, so the <laughs> American world is more complicated. But, um, you know, there are extraordinary virtues in that society. There are not inconsiderable ones in ours, <laughs> and, it's, and, and vices in both, too. But I do think that, that some of what Frame, Frame's not looking back from 84 with the same fury that Jutt was looking back from the end of his life, or that Alan Bennett looks back in the history books with a kind of rage at the Thatcherites. I mean, for one thing, Frame, you know, he's closer. The idea that it will go on apparently forever wouldn't have yet occurred to anybody. I mean, I was living in England at that time. I mean, they just wouldn't. I mean, in 84. In 84. This in yeah, I mean, no, it's I mean, it was yeah. an edge of the wedge, as yeah. they like to say. It, you know, it, was, like, it was just yeah. like this kind yeah. of turning yeah. point where the social contract yeah. just it was starting to fray to a great deal. On both yeah. sides of the yeah. Yeah. You haven't yet had the minor strike, but you have had you know, various other unpleasantness. But I do think that, um, that much of the play seems to me to be, a, especially Collins' jokes and some of Jane's are about the psychological blindness <laughs> of David that has political resonance. And I think those are sort of also allegorical statements about the defeat of the left. I guess I did the left. Yeah. I'm just wondering if you could say a few words about the experience of seeing the play, because I guess I'm mean, yeah. probably the only one who okay. played it. Right. I saw it twice. I saw it when it first came out in Britain, and I thought what well, I think now is one of the most interesting plays I've ever ever seen. And I think it was great. Uh, it was done with some success a year later in New York. Um, I remember thinking at the time that, because I'd just seen probably Map of the World, the hair play, I began to think, wow, this, you know, the America at that time was in the grip of a certain <coughs> dr dramaturgical moment in which nobody wrote about politics. I mean, everything, it was just not a good moment for political theater in the United States in the mid 80s. And the Brits were, they had a very lively sort of theatrical Marxist tradition going, but they also had people all over the map. I remember being struck first how exciting it was to watch people, I thought, and I don't know I'm right, reacting to the real thing with very different, but in a certain sense, formally related plays. I had that sense you sometimes have. You know, sometimes you walk out of, you, you're watching something and you're fascinated by it. You walk out of the theater, you try and describe what it's about and it starts to fall apart. But this happened to me most recently twice, maybe three times. It happened with Jerusalem. Anyone see Jerusalem? Yes. Which is, I think, a, astonishing when you're watching it and it just begins, you realize it's an un, very unstable and it's immensely evocative, but it can't be, it can't survive sustained analysis. It doesn't mean it's not brilliant. <coughs> Sorry? I couldn't yeah. sustain and then the next one I thought, which is pretty great, but not as great as it is while you're in the theater, is Venus and Fur. You know, which I also thought was fabulous, but doesn't exactly hold up by the time you're three quarters of the way down the block. I think this holds up just fine. Like fun while you're watching. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> and, and I saw it twice. I mean, it's absolutely yeah. bouleversé. But I think this, my memory was, this is the unusual thing. It's something really good. Somebody wants to find, I think a little ungenerously, literature is the stuff, because it's been contentious to find it, that responds well to criticism. <laughs> that critics can make something of it. It gets better after they've talked about it. Things that critics can't, now that's a somewhat self-serving definition probably by critics. Yeah. And I'm, you should remember <laughs> that I'm not a real lit person. It's Sarah Lawrence. My doctorate's in European history. I write about military stuff. They let me teach comedy which is rather bizarre, and they gave me a chair in international relations, for which I actually no title of any kind. So, you know, I'm, not, I'm not a real lit person. But I do think that um, benefactors, I remember thinking, because I was, I saw it with a very good friend, we were tremendously excited, we must have walked for miles talking about it, that it did that thing, which it's supposed to do. It was rewarding for more than that first half block. That, and I that, and I found it thrilling actually. Then you were benefactor. Yes, I was. Yes. He was my benefactor. Yeah.
Yes. <coughs> yes, yes. And I've always admired him. And I feel a little guilty that I don't like uh, Copenhagen as much as everybody else does, you know, because I don't. But, um, Did you like democracy? I thought it was moving and strange. And it, um, it was one of those places that you walked out of it. And I saw the first production of it, and you couldn't quite figure out what this was about, but you thought it was, and a friend of mine, I saw with a friend of mine who is English, and his mother was a German Jewish emigre in 1936. She married a Quaker botanist, his father, so he's raised a Quaker, but he's bilingual. And he thought, and you know, friend is Jewish, and he thought, this was actually my closest friend, he said he thought there was, the doxy was in some way frame marveling at the, it, it, Democracy is a play which is superficially about a scandal in which an aide to the, to the Chancellor of Germany turns out to be a Soviet agent and brings down a very, very interesting social democratic Chancellor of Billy Bronx. And he thought that what, he thought Frank was thinking, my God, it's only 16 years after Auschwitz and they've got a functioning parliamentary regime. <laughs> it's an amazing achievement. But he thought that in some inchoate way, democracy is a celebration <coughs> of an extreme realist kind. It, you know, you don't get idyllic situations anywhere, but, you, the, but the, the distance between Billy Brandt and you know, Admiral Dennett, to pick the last third right figure, pretty impressive. <laughs> now, I, I found democracy weirdly inchoate, at the, that you weren't quite sure when you left the theater, <laughs> to stick to this rather narrow way of judging things. <laughs> but do you know Michael, what's the, who's the man who did uh, He's a really good Irish playwright. He did Brian Friel. You know, I think Friel begins as a very structured playwright. He becomes a magnificently loose playwright, and then he falls off the edge and becomes a chaotic. I think Dancing at Lunas is the last one where the form, but the apparent formlessness contains the ghosts of form. And then he did Beautiful Tennessee, which is an incomprehensible rubbish. I thought that democracy was evocative, hard to pin down, interesting. <laughs> and annoyed most people who saw it. But I would very much like to read the reviews of the revival. It was revived recently with some success, and the impression I have is that people were much kinder about it. This produces, by the way, an interesting reflection on history plays. A student of mine this semester worked this out. It never occurred to me. She had a brilliant idea for a conference project. She said, a history play is written with a dramatic date that's different from the state of the composition. It produces dramatic irony, fine. What happened when it was revived? A director, a critic, and an audience has to look at a history play from a third, from T3. Mm -hmm. And what would be very interesting, because really good plays get revived a lot, would be to watch the evolution of critical response to a thing which is set in its own past. Because ever, forever after, it's going to have more than one past. And I'd like to know. I should have done this. And I remember thinking, you know, if I was a, I just moved last Wednesday, and I was, you know, I remember thinking, if I was less busy, I'd have gone out and read the reception history through JSTOR. I would have heard Lexus Nexus. And I haven't done it. I know that it was just revived, meaning democracy now. And I don't know how it was received. I just know it was received very generously. But that, but that, I mean, that's what's interesting about that, because it's yeah. your 18, 1984, looking back at 1969, and we're 2013 now looking at both of those, well, you know. What I think is weird about the is I think that 2013 is not different from 1984. We're still suffering from the weird oh, animus towards the liberal state. The wedge is a lot thicker. Yeah, the wedge is thicker, but I think we're still wondering what the hell happened. <laughs> and, that, that, and that we're interested, if we're relatively less cocky, in answering that question carefully, because fast answers have not served as well. You know, so that, I guess that's what I think. I think this is worn well, because its subject seems to me still. And to say the wedge is much thicker, if you mean by that, they've nailed the last nail in the coffin of liberal democracy. I don't know, by one way of looking at the Republican Party's electoral prospects, that they aren't very bright in the long run, and the British Tories seem to have committed an act of self-immolation. And, there, and the, the, Napoleon, after the Battle of Borodino, Tolstoy said, is a dead man who was falling forward. And it may be that Cameron's government is a dead man falling forward. I mean, it's hard to say. So, I mean, I, I, but I, on the other hand, it, I do think that Frame is asking a question that I wind up asking myself all the time, which is what happened? Because you know, <laughs> there's still some inability to, to defend 
the welfare state to Americans. Do you, do you think that, I'm going to read, you know, sort of throw my politics on the table yeah. in this question and not have you read the play, but, um, you know, it's possible to see its own seeds of destruction were in it, that, you know, that uh, liberal politics was sort of a, um, an illusion in some way, that it wasn't the sort of rosy, humane thing that you discussed here, but that it was sort of a, a tool for placating people and making life sort of tolerable, but that the sort of seed, I guess I'm asking you, are the seeds of sort of Reaganism or Thatcherism sort of in, the, okay. in liberalism okay. itself? Okay. I think two things about this. One, I think that the seeds of its own destruction means that destruction is the only possible outcome. I don't think Reagan would have been elected without the Iranian hostage crisis less than 400 days. I think that that was a very, very close call. I think that Thatcher would quite possibly not have been elected without the winter of discontent, although that, you might argue, was deeper in the structure of late labor Britain. I think that Train is interested in ways in which we collaborate in our own defeat. I don't think Frame would believe that the defeat of a humane left is inevitable. I don't think those are his politics. One of the dumbest things the Labour Party did, although you can understand why they did it, was when Thatcher allowed people to buy, working class people who live in what the Brits call social housing, which is council housing, to buy their own homes. The Labour Party understood what would happen. They would buy their home, they'd get 30,000 know, pounds for it from some middle class person that never seen those money in their life. That person would flip it, he'd sell it to a, you know, a banker, the banker would sell it to a, a Saudi, and there wouldn't be anybody living in London anymore who was born there. So, but you can't tell people you're not allowed to own your own home. There was a furious reaction to labor being opposed to your right to buy the house you're living in for which you're paying rent. I still know labor people who are opposed to letting people buy their own homes. That's political suicide. So I think that frame is, you know, tragedy is the condition Kant said, of two good maxims colliding in contradictory form. I, d I think that Frame is deeply interested in ways in which liberalism opened itself up to very successful attack. Seeds of destruction means more to me that <coughs> once you cross the border in Operation Barbarossa, you will be defeated because you can't take Moscow and then you're fine. I mean, I, I, don't, think <laughs> that this, I don't think it contains that inevitable self-destruction in Frame's account. I think he's interested in looking at many of the causes of a deep historic reversal. But it, it's interesting, yeah. though, that he starts out with the idea of, again, to get back to the Sutra yeah. where he says, I have seen this before. Yeah. And, you know, it's the great little project yeah. of, yeah. and he's sort of a comment yeah. on building, deliberately building this sort of imperial yeah. uh, project, you know, and then sort yeah. of uh, mirrors that with David's own yeah. construction okay. for, the, for the masses. Yeah. I, I, I agree with that, absolutely. Yeah. That I do think the opening joke about the Cyril Road, the history of ideas, the welfare, suggests that the welfare state is, is, a, is a late phase of liberal imperialism upon, in which the metropolis has become the colony, yeah. and the rulers are now Jewish liberal pamphlet architects and trade unionists rather than, yeah. okay, yes, let's accept all of that. Then let's make a comparison, it's fine. Sometimes the British Empire was inevitably connected to perverse results and gross self-destruction, maybe condemned to self-destruction no matter what. On the other hand, some places, India springs to mind, where they now have fairly regular elections. In <laughs> or, or even Sheila. Yeah, or even Sheila. Who, who, yeah. who deeply yeah. believes it and yeah. thinks it's a, it's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Now, without going down the road of Neil Ferguson, you know, a certain amount of the world is probably better off because of the British Empire, despite its racism, its internal bad faith by the 1920s, and all the rest of it. I think that Frayne and Sheila probably believe that the welfare state, despite its class biases and an unacknowledgeable crime, was on balance a progressive phase in human life. I think people believe that. Well, maybe you were, saying, to Sorry. you were saying, I heard a talk by Elie Wiesel, who yeah. talked about if you wanted to run, you have to set your, your sights really high because it's very difficult to do all the things you want to do, and you have to understand that. Yeah that there'll be things that will be imperfect, but there, yeah. there is something about sort of setting some yeah. goals or ideals that are helpful to move things and change things. Yeah. I think that that's certainly wise in every way about politics, that <coughs> maximalist programs, sure. The course I just taught last semester 
I won't put it twice, uh, is a course called Seeds of Time, and it's about conjectural histories, about people who write histories of things that didn't happen, which are quite shocking and scandalous, because when we grew up, history, the business of historians was to explain why what happened had to happen. And conjectural historians are interested in subverting our confidence to what <laughs> had to happen, happened. Uh, Hegel said the real is the rational, and that's, you know, the real is sometimes not very rational. <coughs> so I think that, I do think that the Labour Party was overwhelmingly likely to be defeated, although it didn't have to be defeated in 79. I don't think that the Democratic Party was overwhelmingly likely to be defeated, necessarily. I think it was in for some hard times as its unjust punishment for having passed 1964 Civil Rights Act. I mean, I do think that the racial polarization of politics after, and so on and so on. But I do think that there are moments in political history that are more open, moments that seem to me more overdetermined. And I think that he's writing about one where the, I don't think that the Tories had to win the next four elections. You know, that I certainly don't think. You know, but that they were likely to win one soon. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. No questions. It's after time. Yes. Yeah. So was it a bad idea to assign a play that's out of print? There are students or resources. Okay. I hope this was successful.